All right, chapter 12. I'm gonna go back to saying Brooklyn because Brooklyn, I don't know. That just doesn't roll off the tongue. Chapter 12, Brooklyn Feldman. I know the kids here don't like the Oasis as much as their parents do. Why would they? The unplugged thing is a big part of it. For most of us, giving up our phone is worse than being shipwrecked on a desert island. You're shipwrecked, but first, your best friend and constant companion is washed away at sea. I'm not even kidding about that. In real life, I check my phone so often that when I first arrive at the Oasis, I feel its absence like a death in the family. After a while, you stop reaching into your empty pocket for it. I've been coming here every summer since the place opened, so I speak from experience. You get used to it, but it's never good. The food is another problem. Don't get me wrong, I've seen the newspaper reviews. Critics love it. Dietitians love it. Health gurus love it. Kids hate it. It isn't just the meat thing. A lot of kids are vegetarians. A lot of kids like to eat healthy, but this is extreme health. Bare knuckle cage match edition. Let's face it, who wants a carrot stick when you could have a brownie? Who chooses blanched broccoli over nachos or french fries? It's harder for me than any, any of the rest of them. I have to wake up an hour before everyone else so no one figures out which cottage I'm coming from. They see me at awakening or the meditation center or the dining hall and assume I'm just like them. I'm sure they notice that I don't show up for everything. Okay, I don't show up for much. I have my reasons for keeping my distance. Although it does hurt sometimes when I overhear the kids calling me weird. This summer is a little different because of needles. I don't usually let myself get too close to people, but this time around, it just worked out that way. Probably a bad idea, but it's kind of fun having a pet. Needles gets under your skin, and that's and not just when he sinks his little needle teeth into your finger. Besides, Grace has a point that he's not big enough to survive on his own, so he needs us. Maybe that's why it's such a nice feeling, the being needed part. Anyway, I really like Tyrell. I'm not so sure about Grace. I always get the feeling that she's judging me. For sure, she's not a big fan of my lousy attendance at Oasis activities. As for Jet, I'm not sure what to think. He's got a real life, real attitude, but sometimes I get the feeling that deep down, he's not into being that way. He's like only acting. And in the end, he always comes through for needles, which is the most important thing. Also, he hates the Oasis more than everybody else put together. That might be because he comes from a super wealthy family, so he's used to getting his own way. And that doesn't happen here. Don't I know it. I guess I'm a little bit afraid of him, or at least more afraid of him than I am the others. So the next morning, at breakfast, when I jet sets down his tray beside mine, I am instantly on my guard. Why did you lie to us? He demands. No, good morning, Brooklyn. No, how are you doing today? That's another thing about Jet. He gets right to the point. No chit chat. I didn't lie to you. I defend myself. You said the key to the launch is on the hook in the welcome center. Well, it's not there. No hook either. I think fast. The pathfinders must have moved it. What do you need the boat for? He looks disgusted. I have to go back to Hedge Apple. He launches into this crazy story about how he's being blackmailed by Brandon Buckholes. Brandon knows about needles and is threatening to sell us out to the pathfinders unless we buy his silence with candy bars. I almost laugh in Jet's face, except when I think about it, it's not funny at all. Brandon may be a big doofus, but if he spills the beans about the lizard in the paint tray, I know for a fact that Magnus will make us turn Needles loose, which Needles would never survive. It makes no difference that Magnus is the sweetest guy in the world. He's 100% devoted to his Oasis philosophy and pets don't fit into it. I'll go with you, I volunteer. Neither of us can go any place without a boat, he points out, accusing tone back in his voice. I'll find it. You probably just looked in the wrong place. I think he wants to argue with me, but he needs the key, so he keeps his mouth shut. The key is exactly where I knew it would be, and it has nothing to do with the welcome center. Jet and I plan our trip for late afternoon. This time, we decide not to tell Grace and Tyrell. Ivory and a few of the other Pathfinders are holding a kite flying tournament, and if those two don't enter, it'll be suspicious. Nobody will miss Jet and me, since we don't show up most of the time anyway. We meet at the hidden dock. When I produce the key, Jet shoots me a piercing look. Where was it? I give him my story about how the hook fell out and the key bounced under the counter. I add, guys always expect everything to be laid out for them. It's part of that never asking for directions thing. He draws himself up to his full height, which is still shorter than mine. Nobody asks for directions anymore. Fuego Nav can tell you if there's a swarm of gnats hovering over the road you're driving on. I could feel his suspicious gaze as I start the launch and guide it out into the river. Maybe that's why I'm so uneasy about Jet. Not because of his wisecracks, but because he's smart. 
All the more reason why joining Team Lizard was a bad idea for someone in my situation. Too late to change that now. About halfway to Hedge Apple, we spy a couple of the kites from the competition soaring above the trees. I point, I think the red one is the long tail is Grace. She wins every year. He jumps all over that. You're a regular here? Your family comes every summer? Since I was six, even longer than Grace. He whistles. Your folks must be serious Nimbus fans. I sigh. You'll never know how big. He comes up behind me, and the next thing I know, he's taken over the wheel. To my questioning look, he replies, why don't you let me drive for a while? You can watch the kites. Maybe you'll see Grace win another trophy. Oh, there aren't any trophies, I tell him. Magnus doesn't believe in trinkets. He's all about participating, not winning and losing. You can't be whole if you're showing off. Vlad would never go for that, Jet comments. He refuses to waste his time on anything he can't rule the wor world at. He doesn't sound bitter exactly, but I get the impression that growing up with someone famous like Vladimir Baranov isn't the easiest thing in the world. I can relate. The ride takes about the same 20 minutes as last time. This is the slower direction since we're working against the current. I keep my eyes on the kites mostly which are lower in the sky as we move farther away, but I can't help noticing that Jet seems to be enjoying himself at the wheel, making spaceship sounds under his breath along with explosions as he pumps his thumbs at imaginary weapons. Magnus definitely wouldn't approve of warplay, but to me this is the most appealing side of Jet I've seen so far. He normally acts older and jaded, but now he's almost a little kid lost in his imagination, having fun. Once in Hedge Apple, we tie up the launch and head out into the main drag. I start towards the small grocery mart. Candy shopping, right? I'll take care of that, he decides. You're going to the hardware store. Why, I ask, to pick up a screwdriver in case your Dance Dance Revolution machine needs fixing? He smiles appreciatively at my joke. See in the window where it says keys duplicated? Copy the boat key. I must look stricken because he adds, you know, in case the real one falls off the wall and bounces under the counter again. Ouch. If there was any doubt that Jet doesn't trust me, that's gone. Still, maybe for the best that we have our, each our own copy. That way I can stop explaining why I can always find it and others can't. I'm a little nervous that the hardware store lady will ask me a lot of nosy questions about the key, but she takes it along with the five bucks plus tax and screeches out a copy on the machine. When I say, it's for my mom, she looks as if she couldn't care less if it was for Jack the Ripper. I step out onto the street just as Jet emerges from the market carrying a pretty big bag. It's not all candy bars, he explains. I picked up some more ground beef for needles. It's his favorite. I can't help smiling. When Jet talks about needles, he lights up. That might be because he's focusing on others, not just himself. Okay, in this case, others means a lizard, but it's a start. Any chance Brandon can spare a couple of those three musketeers for you and me, I ask him. I like the way you think, he approves, but I wouldn't want to spoil your appetite. I guess I look disappointed because he goes on, not for Oasis food. I wouldn't slop the hogs with that. But there's that barbecue place and I'm dying for something unhealthy. You in? Last time I felt a bit guilty because Grace was there, which is almost like being with Magnus himself. This time I don't even hesitate. It's brisket or bust. I'm done with my sandwich before Jet gets much more than halfway through his burnt ends and the turkey combo. He's impressed. Nice. Have another one. My treat. I'm good, I say contentedly, stifling an unladylike burp. It's little binges like this that get me through another summer at Oasis. A whole summer? That's rough. I'm only doing a month and a half for disrupting takeoffs and landing at SF F SFO. What crime did you have to commit Ooh. to get sentenced here every summer since you were six? Needing to change the subject, I make a quick count of the candy on the grocery bag at our feet. 27 bars won't last all month. I thought of that, Chet admits. I don't want to pack our fridge with chocolate. Matt looks the other way, but he has his limits. Anyway, we'll come back to Hedge Apple. We need, we'll need more meat for needles. Besides, I'm kind of curious about that. We're at a small booth in the barbecue place by a window that looks out through a break in the trees for a pretty good view of the Hedge Apple Mega Mansion. Although that might not be the right name for it. Hedge Apple is barely a whistle stop and the big house is at least a half a mile away. No way it's inside the town limits of such a limited town. The waitress comes over with our bill and catches us staring. Some house, huh? They say it has 17 bathrooms. What does one guy do with 17 bathrooms? One guy, Jet seizes on that. You know who lives there? You mean Snapper? That's what everybody calls him, but I doubt it's his real name. Snapper, I repeat, what does he look like? Old, young? She shrugs. I've only seen him from a distance. 
He flashes by in this really cool car, but he's usually going too fast for anyone to get a good look at him. Big guy, always wears sunglasses. Jets, brow furrows. I thought everybody knows everybody in a small place. He must live somewhere else too. He never comes to town except through, except to drive through. I whistle. Can you imagine building a house like that and then leaving it empty? I can, Jet volunteers. Vlad has more houses he can remember. Seriously, he forgot about the villa in Tuscany until someone sent a bill for the roof repair. Oh, this place is never empty, the waitress informs him. Snapper's guys are always there. Guys, I echo? You mean maintenance people and housekeepers? Maybe. She sounds dubious, but I can't picture them folding towels and dusting. They look more like professional wrestlers to me. Bodyguards, Jet wonders. For a guy who's never there, I challenge. I know, the waitress agrees. It's a real mystery. And then she yawns like, it really isn't a mystery at all because who cares? I suppose it makes sense. The locals are used to this strange neighbor. He and his fancy car were big news for a while, but eventually even the mega mansion in the middle of nowhere becomes just another part of the scenery, like a weathered fishing shacks by the dock and the twists and turns of the Saline River. After we eat, as we're heading back towards the launch, I ask Jet, you don't think this snapper guy is some kind of gangster, do you? I doubt it, he replies. No self-respecting gangster would be caught dead in the backwater like a hedge apple. Maybe that makes a good place to hide out, I suggest. Maybe, but I can tell he's not convinced. He wants to get to the bottom of this, and I have a sneaking suspicion that Vlad isn't the only re relentless person in the Baranov family. We start the boat with a new key. It works perfectly. Jet drives all the way home. I keep my eyes on the sky where there are still a couple of kites in the air. That's a good sign. It means the competition hasn't ended yet, so we haven't been gone long enough to be missed. Back at the hidden dock, we tie up the launch. As we start along the path to the oasis, Jet stuffs the new key in the front pocket of his shorts. Hey, that's not yours. You've got your own key, he retorts. This one belongs to the Pathfinders, I reason. The new one should be all of ours, Grace and Tyrell's too. He snorts a laugh. I kind of doubt Grace is ever going back to Hedge Apple again. It almost killed her the first time. And Tyrell got seasick on a two mile boat ride. He isn't exactly an old sea salt. I dig in my heels. You never know when one of us might have to make an emergency trip to buy food for needles or even candy bars so Brandon won't blab to the Pathfinders. I honestly don't expect him to give in. He does, though. He does, though. And we end up hiding the key in a knot hole under a loose board in the dock. I pay the price for that minor victory. In Hedge Apple, I thought we were starting to hit it off. But as we head back to the center, he's looking at me with suspicion again. And that's not good news when you've got a secret.